hope you enjoy today's message on Acts chapter 2 verse 38 preaching channel. Please like, comment, subscribe, share, and hit the bell to help us grow. And uh, I did time this out. I had it all worked out. and The Lord had different plans, I guess. But anyway, this is very important for you to realize, and I just want to make sure that nobody mistakes what I'm doing here. This lesson is rated R. So viewers are strongly cautioned. Okay. Uh, there are going to be very disturbing images. And it is going to be some very mature thematic elements, adult stuff. Some strong language. And brief nudity. <laughs> See, I got her attention, didn't I? <laughs> I really like that lapel mic, but Brother Brandon says I beat it up. Oh, no. Yeah. yeah, it's good to be able to beat up something at my age, I guess. But anyway, I'm going to be doing a very quickly re review. Here's a disturbing image to start out with. You know, it's <laughs> from a book I've written, okay? This is a, a book. It's taken me a lifetime to write it, and I'm still not done with it, so I don't think it'll ever be done. Anyway. The theme we're talking about, and I am getting serious here, and it's a very, very serious subject. It's a great and unique theme, very, very unique to the Bible of all religious books in the world. It is unique, and that is the theme of redemption. It is uh, our privilege as Christians to be able to take part, take of that. And again, we just quickly look at a few things here from the Greek translation of the Bible. There are four Greek words or concepts, ideas that are given to us through Scripture. The first is an act of liberation. I'm not going to go through each one and explain them again, but we'll just, just take them as they are. <clears throat> Another concept or idea of re redeeming is an act of redemption by purchase, being bought, an exchange of currency, whatever you want to look at it. There's another concept known as thoroughly redeemed through and through that is talked about by Luke. An everlasting purchase never to be enslaved again, which is primarily where, where we're going to be focused on because so many concepts and ideas in here makes my head swim with all the things and possibilities that there are with this, but that's primarily what we're looking at, okay? Now, having redemption, what do you got to be redeemed from? And that is simply sin. And we looked at some of the uh, uh, definitions given in Scripture. Of course, we very familiar transgression of the law is one of them. And as you go through and you can look at, look at this for yourself, there's all kinds of, kinds of uh, concepts in, involved with sin, one of them being lawlessness. Nothing, there's no law involved. Anarchy, if you will, could be another term for it. Uh, you're unrestrained from doing anything. Anything is possible. Anything can be done by any individual. You can be unregulated. Nothing controls you. Nothing, nothing controls you of what you can do, what's possible for you to take a gun and murder someone if you, if you so choose. And it brings us down to basically unrighteousness. And uh, Righteousness is a word used to describe the state of being in conformity with God's laws and his requirements. Therefore, the opposite, unrighteousness, is the state of being in nonconformity with God's laws and requirement. God said in Hebrews 1.9, you have loved righteousness and you have hated lawlessness. The you here is referring to God. God has loved righteousness and has hated lawlessness. So you can begin to see the contrast that unrighteousness and lawlessness are basically the same thing. Okay, now the Bible clearly expects, uh, uh, you know, it really clearly shows what God expects of us. Like the Ten Commandments, I guess I passed over it, but uh, I'm sorry, I got ahead of myself there, didn't I? First of all, God calls us sinners. It's it's not something we came up with. No, nobody's coined that term, but God is calling us sinners because we've all fallen short of the glory of God. Romans three twenty three. God blames us for what we know is wrong, but we still do. And the Bible very clearly tells us what those things are, such as the Ten Commandments. 
God will not blame us for some unknown mistakes done against some unknown laws of God. Right. Romans 2, and, uh, chapter, uh, verses 1 through 15. And then, as human beings, the Bible describes us so completely, our moral relations, and I'm going to do this very quickly, our moral relations, our lost conditions, and our need for redemption. All men and women everywhere know themselves to be free and responsible agents, moral agents and beings. They know they are accountable and can be punished for their deeds. And here's a quick explanation why. And to look at that, we've got to look at our human nature. Forget this book, it's okay. You don't want to know about our human nature for dummies. <laughs> there, but there you are. Choose wisely, you big moron. Never mind. Uh, that's a whole other thing we won't worry about right now. But our human nature is very, very unique. We love to party. We love to get silly and goof off. And man, can we get angry? And anger is such a strong emotion. That's just part of naturally being a human being. And then there's us who, well, we decide, well, I'm going to put these things all over here and there and pierce and that. And, and we love to be current with the culture we're in, don't we? Look at the, the hairdos, which one could get envious of, I guess. But, and then there's <laughs> being in utter control, dict dictatorial. People want to control everything. Some people just are like that. And then, of course, there are times of our lives that are just so happy. So good, and other times of our lives we're betrayed by someone that we trust, and it throws us, rocks our world to, uh, I don't want to live anymore. It's just, it can get that bad. It's part of our human nature. And yet there is also a dark side to it, isn't there? And so, we're, you know, our human nature is just part of us. We really sometimes don't even think about what we are like because we are just being what we are. We don't think about these things very much. And so the question, it really becomes to ourselves, why are we like we are? What is it about being a human being that makes us so different from all other created beings such as animals, birds, or fish? Now, to illustrate the difference, again, this is a disturbing image, and I apologize up front if this brings up memories of you having abuse in your life. But what if someone did this to you, just out of nowhere? You're walking down the street or wherever you are, they just come up and slug you. You do not need a Bible. You do not need the Koran. You do not need anything religious to tell you that's wrong. All right? I hope I made that very clear back then, okay? And here's the G-rated version. I didn't want to show you too much of that, so just to make sure you, you understand. I'm trying to be a nice guy. <laughs> Terrible things, right? Now, so you, you see the difference, right? Now... You do not need a religious book, but somewhere in life, you know, yeah, you, you understand this because in your lifetime, somewhere along the line, you are going to be insulted, lied about, abused, whatever you're going to be, you are going to have something happen to you. And you know it's wrong. You don't have to have a Bible to tell you or anything else. It's wrong, right? Now, when you're a kid, you don't know nothing. You're just a little kid having a good time playing with your toys and Everything's good, everything's having, you're having fun, and, and you know, there's always seems to be this uh, one little kid, like, you always wondered about him, you know, there's always someone around, and he, he just, he, he's probably a little sneaky, you know, so he probably goes behind your back, and before you know it, he shows up out of nowhere, grabs your toys and steals it, and you as a baby don't know nothing, your whole world is rocked. And you don't need a Bible at that point. You don't even know what a Bible is. But you know something was wrong. Right? So, how did you know that you, uh, that was wrong even before mom and dad or society tells you it was wrong is because it is part of your human nature. It doesn't matter whether you are black or white, whether you're a Hindu or a Buddhist or an atheist, whether you are the richest man in the world or the poorest, and whether you're an Einstein or just a big moron, it doesn't matter. You all know there's right and wrong. Okay, and the very simple, plain matter of the fact is this. The difference, very simply, the difference between being right and wrong is morals. People have morals. Hitler had morals. Okay, so a lot of people followed Hitler and decided his morals were good enough for me. So, 
and we all struggle with these. We're back and forth every day. We're thinking, do I do right? Do I do wrong? Do I do right? Do I do wrong? And it's all day long we're deciding those kind of things within, within ourselves. All mankind has this same moral awareness and understanding. Now, so that makes us moral beings. And uh, a heathen man, you know, he may be ignorant and primitive, but the law of God is written in his heart. And whether you're smart as you can be and you've read every book in the whole wide world, you still know that there is a right and wrong and you can feel guilty for your wrong behavior. You have a moral awareness. And that very simple, simply being is <clears throat> when you hear the term the law of God is written in their hearts, that's what it means. Whether you're religious or not, it's in there. It's your human nature. It's part of you whether you like it or not. Okay? Now... For instance, does a thief mind being stolen from? Uh, a thief may be, a, a man may himself be a thief, okay? He may, that's what he decides to do. But does that mean he has no feelings or convictions against stealing? Does a thief mind being stolen from? I mean, even a, a, an old lady doesn't want, uh, you know, he'll, she'll take a purse from a guy anytime, right? But... <laughs> There are, if there were no common standard, but you know, just the point is, is that thieves, even though they may do it, they don't like it being done to them. They know that's wrong one way or the other as well. They just, it's all up here. And another example of this human nature is human government, what's the need for human government if there were no right and wrong? If a bunch of us didn't decide that these guys are doing right and these guys are doing wrong, there wouldn't be no need for human government. I mean, but yet you have it from the tribal chief in the primitive jungles to the highest society forms of society we have. Laws make us responsible and accountable for the things we do. <clears throat> Just keep going here. Uh, I, just, I want to keep moving. Okay. Further proof. The fact that someone will deny the wrong they have done shows that they recognize that there is an absolute standard of right and wrong called the denial factor. Let's say a man is accused of stealing or cheating, or, or lying, it can only be, why, why does he deny it? It can only be that he recognizes what he has done is wrong, and, and he would have no reason to hide or deny it if he did not recognize it as being wrong. The fact that men everywhere recognize these kind of things, and this is, uh, we'll just skip this part here, sorry, it's not really that important. Uh, the fact that men uh, uh, blame other men for wrongdoing show that all men have the law of God written in their hearts. That's what I'm trying to come bring across to you very quickly. And all people be, uh, represent being treated unjustly or unfairly. We have all been there. If you are abused with degrading or filthy language, you become offended. You blame the one who offends you. And yet if you were to explain to us that you have not been really been wronged, you just think you've been wronged because of your religious education or your environment. You judge that person a, a, a fit candidate for the crazy house. It's just not, doesn't make any sense. The truth is, again, all men blame other men for wrongdoing. This is true even if they don't know they themselves are, even if they know they themselves are guilty of the same things. A man may be a liar, a thief, and a cheat himself, but he still judges those same quality, qualities as wrong in others. Now, let's go back to the Bible. And what you find is that the Bible represents you to be just exactly as you know yourself to be, a responsible, rational, moral being, knowing the difference between right and wrong. You know that. And on the other hand, the flip side of the coin, the Bible also represents you as resisting your God-given reason, ignoring your own conscience, and abusing your free will. It's like putting your head in the sand, Okay. The Bible does this. That's what makes it such a unique book. And just like these gears intermesh together, one wheel representing God's law and one representing our human nature, obeying God's word is in agreement with the human nature God has given us. Very plain and simple. And on the other hand, again, disobedience, the flip side of the coin, to God's word is not in agreement with the human nature God has given us. It is like 
trying to put a square peg in a round hole of equal size, it ain't going to fit. It just does not go together. It's not compatible. Here we have a, again, the Bible, I want to just reinforce it, that the Bible is describing us so completely, our moral relations, our lost condition, and our need for redemption, which is what we're trying to talk about. A little further on here, we come across the idea that this is extremely compelling evidence that the Bible is not a man-made book, but is divinely inspired. All the truths of the Bible are in harmony with man's reason, his moral nature, and his consciousness. The scriptures never teach anything that you and I, as rational, moral people, that we would know to be false, unjust, or impossible. Now, here we have a picture that has a contradiction in it. We just look at that, and that's just, it just doesn't, that just does not go together. They're competitors. And a sign like this, always open, closed. It's just a contradiction. And if there were a contradiction in the Bible, we would have the perfect excuse to ignore the Bible as just another book in the library. So what you're seeing here is, is that Christians are not gullible. You're not just following this because I'm weak. Your moral nature tells you this is true. It's just the way it is. What we are, what Christians are, are reasonable and rational. This is the, what we are, okay? And as you can see here, in a second, if we are living out our faith according to the scriptures, we all get along very nicely. Christians live in agreement with the evidence of their rational, moral nature, and this verifies the Bible is in harmony with truth, justice, and the American way, or just plain old common sense, and is therefore from God. We all come from so many backgrounds, so many diverse ways, and yet when we can come together, we can be in harmony, we can be in agreement, we can do this. All right, on the other hand, flip side of the coin again, uh, there are those who refuse to believe the Bible, and are irrational and in denial. As in the photo of this banana, the banana can deny what it is and claim it is an apple all at once, but it doesn't change the fact that it is still a banana. You are what you are. Pe okay. People reject and resist the evidence that their rational, moral, human nature verifies the truth of the Bible. They don't want to hear it. Plug, it, plug your ears. They, denying your own human nature to yourself is irrational. If you read that book and you don't see their self in there, reflected in there, that's irrational. Something's in your, your thinking is not rational. And this is important to realize. Because when you deal with people, you need to realize whether they're irrational or not. And if they're irrational, that's something you've got to learn how to deal with and know how to figure out how to get past their irrationality. And that's something I've been thinking about a lot. I haven't quite come to some good conclusions or good answers yet. Now... The perfect example of being irrational is Lucifer himself. In the Amplified Version, Isaiah 14, 13 through 14, And you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God, I will sit upon the mount of assembly in the uttermost north, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, I will make myself like the Most High. That's what I want to look at, is the irrationality of that statement. I will make myself like the Most High. So now, how... How Lucifer could come to this point about thinking he could make himself. This is all thinking here now, okay? First of all, he denies to himself he was created. He denies to himself he owes his, his entire existence to God because there's only one God. It's irrational. It's not logical. It doesn't make sense. Lucifer has a beginning and has an end. He denies to himself he has no possible way to make himself have no beginning or no end. This is irrational. It is not logical. It doesn't make sense. Lucifer denies to himself he has the same power as God for one. For one thing, he couldn't speak the words and bring about another universe like the one he already existed in. It's irrational. It doesn't make sense. It's illogical. Irrational. Lucifer denies to himself he doesn't have the same authority as God. For one thing, only one-third of the angels went with him. Somehow, I don't think the other two-thirds are taking orders from him at the moment. Um, or how about in the book of Job when Lucifer has to come before God and ask permission to do all the terrible things that come along to, to Job. It's irrational, it's not logical, it doesn't make any sense. Lucifer denies to himself he was created. 
He has no ability to create any sort of living creature, planet, or universe. It's irrational, it's not logical, it doesn't make sense. Lucifer denies to himself he doesn't know everything. If he did know everything, he would know how irrational and illogical he was. So we are looking at... Uh, it, also, he's not present everywhere, so he's, you know, he cannot do that. It is illogical for him and irrational for him to do that. And we are, again, we are looking at heavy-duty denial. It's just like the banana and the apple, heavy-duty denial. And how could Lucer possibly think he could make himself to be like God? It is irrational. All right? Now, if you're willing to admit it, and I am, I have been irrational when it came to thinking about God. I have been an unrepentant sinner. And an unrepentant sinner, they, you know, they just refuse to listen to reason. No. We, you've all been there. You've all at some time or other probably decided, I don't believe this stuff. What, God, all that? I, come on. And yet... We see where the irrational thinking comes from, where it originated. We, we all refuse to listen to reason at one time or another, and even in our lives today, as, as my prime example is, I'm irrational in certain parts of my life. All right? And we're all there. We have certain parts where you know it's, if you overeat, it's not good for your health. You know if you're smoking and drinking, eventually it's going to cause cirrhosis, cirrhosis of the liver or lung cancer or whatever. You know those things are bad for you, yet you do them. You deny to yourself, and that's irrational. You deny to yourself that those are bad for you. You're still doing them, okay? You refuse to listen to reason. Some quick examples of rational and irrational. Just a really nice-looking little dog there. Isn't that? Just a, wouldn't you want to pet him and hug him and all that? Then you got an irrational dog. <laughs> Just like, whoa. Back off from that one. And then you have another example of rational and irrationality. Brother McKenzie suggested that I should have left it alone. <laughs> but I like Sister McKenzie, so we'll fix that. <laughs> Just, okay, that's, for those of you who know what, what's going on out there, that's Amy Winehouse. Okay, just so you know. Anyway, that's scary stuff. Now, anyway... That's examples of irrationality and rational and irrationality. Very quickly, another thing that just gets me every single time I look at this is mugshots of a woman over a period of time. And you can see uh, as time progressed, as she went along, somewhere along here she managed to come back. A very, very attractive young lady, a very nice looking lady. Something just isn't connected in her life, her reasoning, her thinking process, whatever it may be. But look what, what change there was from here to there. It's drastic, you know. It's the result of irrational thinking, where it can take you, what it can do to your life. It's mind-boggling. But what you see is that sin is what brings this about. It's the ultimate bondage and enslavement. Addictions, lusts, and evil lifestyles all prove to be terrifying taskmasters masters in the end. Paul declared that even he was a slave to the law of sin according to his sinful nature, the flesh. Man has been given a free will to make any choice he wants to. Now, what happens when you make that choice to deny the morals in your human nature that's as normal to you as it is for everyone on the planet? You have no other choice but to come into sin and unbelief. That's where it leads you. If you choose to deny the morals in your own human nature, what is the answer? Well, we know through, through the scriptures that Jesus is still the answer for our irrational thinking, for sin and unbelief. Now, if the Bible were to so obviously go against our human nature, you could not believe the Bible without being irrational. But when we look into the, I'm going to move this along here. When we look into the mirror of our human nature and see the exact same image there as is pictured in the Bible, we would know the Bible, we know the Bible is, is the Word of God, okay? We, we just know it because we can see it when we look in the mirror. 
The image in the mirror of our nature, if, if the image in the mirror of our nature were different than pictured in the Bible, we would know the Bible was false and not the word of God. However, our human nature agrees in every area of our existence with what is revealed to us in the Bible, and this harmony and agreement between the Bible and our human nature, our human moral nature, that's supernatural. That's the supernatural connection that comes into play. The Bible mirrors man's nature and conditions so exactly that such harmony would be impossible without any other explanation than that the Bible is indeed a supernatural book inspired by God. Now, again, our human nature is very interesting, so exactly where does our human nature come from, okay? Where did it come from originally? Well, we've got to go back to the beginning. And it starts in the book of Genesis with the creation of Adam. Genesis 1.27, the Amplified Version, so God created man in his own image, in the image and likeness of God, created he him. We are created in the image and likeness of God with emotions, intellect, reason, conscience, and free will. Out of all the creation process God performed during those six days, we human beings alone have the high honor of being made in his image and likeness. And each of us being an image and likeness of God means the original human nature we each have is good and upright. It has that aspect to it. Okay? Just like this guy here coming up, right? Created in his image and likeness, everything we are and have at birth comes to us from God. I am what I am, folks. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Now, moving on along real quick here. Since we are not born sinners, it means every human being determines how much he abuses his or her knowledge of good and evil. Okay? And you will have some very, very famous people. They are, they are, they are responsible for how much they abuse their knowledge of good and evil doesn't matter who they are. The most famous people that we can recognize in history or that we know contemporarily here. Okay, and then there's the not so famous. The everyday person, the average person that goes about living their lives, doing what they think they want to do and, and you know, pleasing themselves, whether it's through drink, through alcohol, through a lifestyle. It doesn't matter. They, they're going about their lives and whatever, whatever makes them feel happy and feel good and they go along and everything's fine and dandy. But whatever condition you are in, that you are still capable of abusing your knowledge of good and evil. Now, you become a sinner after you reach the age of accountability, knowing the difference between right and wrong. So that, that is when things really start to happen and you have to be watching for yourself again. We're going to go back to the beginning of our human nature. God creates a beautiful garden for Adam called Eden, or a garden of delight. And uh, earlier I mentioned brief nudity. Well, this guy will show you where it's at right there. <laughs> okay. That's the brief nudity. So it, now that you've got it out of the way and you wondered what that was all about. All right. <laughs> out of the ground. Uh, and out of the ground, the Lord God made to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight or to be desired, that is, was good, suitable, pleasant for food. And then in the middle of that garden, there were some trees, and they had the tree of life in the center of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of the difference between good and evil. And interesting, in the Amplified Version, it mentions blessing and calamity. You're going to know the difference not only between good and evil, but you're going to know the difference between blessing and calamity. Blessing sounds good, but calamity? Oh. All right. Um, I, it's an interesting thing to think about in that sense. But up until now, all Adam knew was that everything was good. So if everything was good, what is this thing called evil? What is that? Why, why, why does he... 
God tell me I shouldn't want to know about that? Or why is he keeping me from this, okay? So evil is introduced to us as something different from good on a tree in the Garden of Eden, and God gives them warning to not eat the fruit, okay? It's something there that he said, don't do this. Never have they, never has God in all the time that they've existed told them not to do anything. Go ahead, man, have at it. You know, there's so much out there. You can explore forever if you want to, you know. But he said, don't eat the fruit from, eat the fruit from this tree. And he warned them very dramatically to not do that because the day you do that, you will die. Now, what did that mean? Okay, well, that's another whole thing. So, let, I just want to make sure we understand why we need to be redeemed from sin. Well, from sin, evil comes from sin, or evil created the sin that we all have to deal with. We need to look at where evil came from originally, and that's what I want to focus on very quickly. Actually, it came from the beginning of, of evil, came from the world of angels. They were created by God, and they have minds. They have feelings. They have free will. I've got scripture references there. And they're not limited by their physical bodies. But this is where it all started. Evil appeared in the world of angels when Lucifer rebelled. He rebelled against the God-established order of authority and rank. Now, Ezekiel, Ezekiel 28, 15 through 17, this angel who became Satan, which means adversary, out of Lucifer, which is an angel of light. Scriptures say here, your heart was proud and lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. It, all right, I hit too many one times. But anyway, the cause of Lucifer's fall was a number of things. It starts with pride. And then the desire to be independent from God and to not submit to God's authority and to not be inferior to God. It's kind of like a microcosm of really how most people think in that sense, right? But this is what caused him to fall. Now, Lucifer, what, what, what all this sums, down, uh, sums up to be is that Lucifer wanted to be by himself more than his created status or rank allowed him to be. He was a created being. That, that's his status. He's not a god. There's only one. He had a status that he was created in. Just as human beings, we have our status that we're created in. Now, he wanted to be, be that way by his own, be his own separate authority. The fall of Lucifer could never have happened, however, if he did not have a real freedom of choice. Lucifer had the ability to choose either to obey God and recognize God as the whole basis of his existence or to follow a selfish way and to look for his own way of doing things and to be his own authority. Now, <clears throat> Lucifer's choice, which was freely made to follow a selfish way, to look for his own way of doing things, to be his own authority, is the origin of evil. In the universe. We've, we've heard that word evil all, all the time. It's used in so many different contexts. And you, sometimes you don't really think about where did it really come from. And that understanding should be a foundational for Christians to know where did that come from? Where, what does evil really mean? Where did it come from? To follow a selfish way, to look for his own way of doing things, to be his own authority. Sure sounds like me. <laughs> Sound like you? It's something there that, that, that uh, part of how we are, that we see these things and we want to follow a selfish way. And even now, I mean, I'm selfish in many ways, in different ways that I try to overcome and realize that I'm being that. 
and my own way of doing things. And instead of letting God do things, try to do it my, by my own power. And to be my own authority and figure out I'll solve this. And if I can't solve it someday, I'll get back to God and let him figure it out. It, but we are all there. We all think along those lines. And so what we really need to realize, therefore, is this. <clears throat> Evil was not created by God. Evil is a perversion by one of his created beings. Evil is the result of using free will against the very purpose free will was created for. That kind of takes a seal a moment. Let that all sink in. You know? Although, as human beings, we have real freedom to refuse evil, we don't refuse it. Just look at the world around you. We're weighing that, that good and evil in our lives every single day. All right? But by, mis, by misusing the freedom of choice God has given us, we, you and I, we end up underneath the rule of a tyrant known as Satan or known as the God of this world in 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, the prince of this world in John 14.30, and the prince of the power of the air in Ephesians 2 and 2. And you know what? Then we become the ones who are doing the evil in the world. You know, I, I, for the young people, sometimes they just say, you know, I'm getting off, I'm going to get, my, I want to finish. And I don't think our young people really understand the evil that they face out there. They want to get off on their own and do their own thing. I want to get out from under mom and dad. Oh, they're too tough on me. I can't handle this. You know, I've got to go on my own. You don't have a clue what kind of evil is out there. What is out there and confronts you? You're going to, con you're going to go out there and, and in this world try to confront the evils out there on your own abilities and power? That's irrational. It's illogical. doesn't make sense. I'll just give you that much. All right, let's go on. All right. You have a free will to decide what you want to do. No one stops you from choosing good or evil. You have it in your ability to do. From the little youngsters and rugrat that you were, you just kind of decide what's happening with yourself, how you're going to do things. You, you decide someday who you want to fall in love with or get married to and how you treat other people in that relationship or how you treat your body when you're out with other people or what you decide to do with it. You're deciding that all the time. No one's twisting your arm. But you have the right to decide which way you want to do things. Free will, man, that's a powerful thing that God has given us. And that's something we should hold sacred. Now, out of all these things, in addition to that, God does not force a relationship on you. He, he, he's not going to do that. You freely decide when your hands go somewhere, whether it goes out to make a deal with the devil or whether it goes up towards the God that gave, made you who you are and what you, what you exist as. So you decide which way you're going. But you freely decide. Don't blame it on anybody else. A lot of people like to do that. Well, I'll blame it on the devil. I'll blame it on the... No. You got the free will to decide for yourself. It's on you. Now, God would be considered unjust if he forced humans to live in the presence, in his presence, against their will. You do what I tell you to or else. Okay? It is not God's nature to be unjust. He's not going to tell you, lean over your shoulder and say, don't do that, don't do this. You've got to decide for yourself. It is not God's nature to be unjust. 
Evil was not intended by God and does not come from the essence of God or his creation. Evil comes from freely deciding to not want a relationship from God. Now think about it. God did not want Adam to have to learn about the difference between good and evil or blessing and calamity. Why didn't God want Adam and Eve to learn the difference between good and evil? Because as we know all too well, as human beings, it causes us pain, suffering, travail, sorrow. God does not want religion. He wants relationship. It's what he wanted from the beginning with Adam and Eve. That's all he wanted. And he was trusting them that they would freely choose to do that. And our relationship with God is the very meaning of our human existence. It is why we're here. That's our created status was for that purpose, to have the relationship with Jesus Christ. Although as human beings we have real freedom to refuse evil, we don't refuse it so evil continues to spread. And hmm, we'll skip this. With our freedom of choice, what we are saying is this, is that we want a total separation from God. And when I say we, I mean in general human nature. All these people and their lifestyles, what they're saying is they want a total separation from God. They do not want to depend on him for anything. They want to depend on themselves. Now, let's look at the aspect of this. They just want to be separated from God. i got to keep moving here quickly. I can see my time is running out. How much? Okay. Separation from God. For Adam and Eve, it was a traumatic event. How many generations are we away from that? We're not too worried about it anymore, are we? It doesn't seem like it. Because you know what? It's because we have a comfortable lifestyle. (sighs) You know, in this general area, Oakland County, usually we're one of the five richest counties in the country. uh, Right now, I don't know what it is because of the economic conditions, but we have a comfortable lifestyle. Granted, some of them, our houses are not as nice as this. Some of them are nicer, but we, you know, we have, we go in our backyards. We have good times. We have all kinds of things that we can do, play sets for our kids, just wonderful things that we can uh, help our kids to enjoy. It's just a wonderful and comfortable lifestyle that God has given us, isn't it? This, this country we live in is fantastic. We are blessed. Oh, there you go. Now we're getting home here. Right? Good stuff here. I mean, it's the American dream to have all of these things. And we have the comfortable lifestyle. I'm going to move through some of these. We, we play uh, uh, video games. We have big screen TVs. Whatever you, you want, basically, we're having, you know. We continue to have that lifestyle. When we decide to go out to eat, Oh, I don't want that. Oh, no, no, let's not do that. Let's go over here. No, I'm so tired of that. Let's, so many choices we have available. Other people are scrounging for food, and we got multiple choices here. Oh, yeah. That was for me. <laughs> and then you have a comfortable lifestyle. I'm running through this quickly, but going to uh, the Magic Kingdom. That's the Mecca for all Americans, right? Vacations on cruise ships and all the wonderful lifestyles we have, right? We're so engro- engrossed in all of these available options that the people across the street aren't even impacted by the fact that they're separated from God. If a person has lived his life separate from God, and if he's basically doing all right, he has a house, food to eat, and he's not desperately lonely, most human beings can get used to being separated from God and not notice they're missing anything. It's, that's what it is. Unfortunately for many people, they only turn to God when trouble beyond their ability to fix their problems comes. That's when people finally come to their senses and seek God. Even so, some stick with it and some don't. In all cases, using free will to make their choices. If God is going to be just and fair, using a fair and just weight and balance, then the consequence of their choices would be that God, then the consequence of their choice would be that God should respect their desire 
to live a separate existence from him as a fulfillment of their choice. And that, my friend, takes you somewhere not so nice. And he's, he has the right to abandon them in a place where he takes away his presence permanently, where separation from him and any good thing he created is forever. And that, my friend, is called hell. You don't hear about it much, but it, is, it exists. Originally created for Lucifer and his fallen angels, and now expanded for his human fallen followers. All these people. Flip coin again. Uh, well, let me finish this then. This, I just want to make sure you understand it because this is part of understanding your free will and choice. Hell will be a place where they are granted the complete freedom and liberty to forever and, and ever renew their choice. Exist by myself. I'm going to exist by myself. You're going to renew that choice all you want. That's where it takes you. That's how critical and important this kind of thing is. And the horrors of that place, I don't even want to think about. Disturbing images. On the uh, flip side, we may have fallen short of the glory of God, but God gives us a way to come back when justice meant mercy was at the cross. Jesus spilled his blood for our sake. The Almighty God, the creator of the universe, wrapped himself in flesh, came to this earth, shed his blood, died on the cross because of the love he, has, he had for what he created and for the free will that he wanted to bring to us. When Jesus died on the cross, he made a way for mankind to no longer have to be separated from him. All right, we're going to move along quickly here. The other hand, the free choice that you get will eventually take you to heaven. And the blood of Jesus Christ is what removes the bonds of slavery to, to our sin, and that gives us the redemption. And how do we... Right, we'll skip this as well. Sorry. Moving along here. How do we have the blood of Jesus Christ applied to our lives by the Acts 2.38, the verse that is so iconic to us, and it is oozing with redemption. Oozing, overflowing with redemption. <clears throat> One more second here. Our chains were broken by the blood of Jesus Christ, and it is why you and I can stand here today and be redeemed. So I can stand here and I can say, I am redeemed. All right? And as the song goes, as we sing here so often enough, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. You need to be saying so. We need to be saying so. And I'm talking to myself as well. What we need to be doing is we need to be saying so through our praise. We need to be, the redeemed of the Lord need to say so through our worship. The redeemed of the Lord need to say so through our witnessing. The redeemed of the Lord need to say so through holy living. The redeemed of the Lord need to say so through Bible study. The redeemed of the Lord need to say so through prayer. <sighs> How much are you saying? How much do you say? I'm talking to myself as well. When we go out, of the, uh, out these doors and out into the mission field, we need to be saying so. We need to let them know there's a redemption. Use your free choice. Don't be irrational. Just try to show them their irrationality. And if you will, would you please be something that the Lord can talk through and use to bring redemption to other people. Thank you for your attention. If the brother ushers would come and take this uh, down.